So what would you think of our church if instead of this wooden cross up here, we had carved very nicely in wood the mushroom cloud, the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima? What would you think of a church that had stained glass, I mean like that colorful stained glass up there, like that glass up there, but the stained glass there had the ovens, the stained glass there had the gas chambers used for the mass killings at Auschwitz. If you think about it, it's very, very strange that the symbol of the church is the cross. New Testament scholar D.A. Carson commenting on our text for today, 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. He says this, Crucifixion was reserved for slaves and barbarians. The cross was not something to be talked about in polite company. Quite apart from the wretched torture inflicted on those who were executed by hanging from a cross, the cultural associations conjured up images of evil and abysmal rejection. Yet today... Crosses adorn our buildings and letterheads, our lapels and our jewelry, and no one is scandalized. It is this cultural distance from the first century that makes it so hard for us to feel the compelling irony of 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. It's really strange to have the cross as a symbol of life and love and hope. The cross is the symbol of Christianity, but the cross is the symbol of death. The cross is the symbol of someone more powerful executing someone less powerful. If you think about it, nobody ever compromised with a cross. Nobody sat down and had a dialogue with a cross. Nobody tentatively took up half of a cross. The cross represents death and separation. The cross owns you and kills you and then brings you to life again. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 at the close of the sermon. I'm going to invite those who know the Lord Jesus Christ to remember his body and his blood. This table is for you if the cross has killed, killed you and then given you life again. Our text is 1 Corinthians 1. We start in verse 17. It says, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called both Jew and Greek, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. 
Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, You are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. This text is all about how only the Holy Spirit of God, present here with us, turns the cross from weakness to strength, from foolishness to wisdom, from death to life. If you've been around Christianity long enough, you should no longer be surprised by the intensity of of the level of reactions to the cross. Verse 18 of chapter 1 gives us two reactions to the cross. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it's the power of God. Some call the cross idiocy, folly. Some call the cross power and glory and life. Two utterly contrasting responses. Why do we have such such opposite responses? Well, because nobody ever compromised with a cross. Nobody ever halfway kind of took the advice of a cross. When we preach the message of the cross, we are not saying, hmm, you should sit up a little straighter. When we preach the message of the cross, we're not saying, you know, I hate to tell you, but you kind of have chronic halitosis. Have you thought about a gargle and a rinse? When we preach the message of the cross, you need to die and rise again. And don't miss that there in verse 18, those two different responses, don't miss this, to those, it's two present participles describing two different kinds of people, there in verse 18, to those who are perishing, it's folly, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The good news of the gospel, do not miss this. The good news of the gospel is that you, 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 And everyone we love can move from one category to the other. You don't have to be locked into the cross is nothing, the cross is foolish, I reject it. What this text says, if it says anything, is when the Spirit of God falls with convicting power in the life of a person, that person moves from calling the cross foolishness and nothing to calling the cross life and wisdom and righteousness and redemption and everything. That's the good news of the gospel. Only the Holy Spirit can make that move because only the Holy Spirit can stop a proud heart from beating so that the proud sinner dies. And only the Holy Spirit can plant within a dead sinner, a humble heart of flesh that beats with new life. The Holy Spirit convinces us that the foolishness of the cross is wisdom. Why is the cross foolishness? Consider the life of Jesus. 
he had, he had this unbelievable, miraculous power, and he never used it to help himself. He didn't make a dime. Jesus had all this power and all this popularity and all this fame and all he ever did was find the lowest and the least and the lepers and the harlots and give everything to them. He didn't amass any worldly clout or fame. In fact, when he was brought before the most powerful leaders in the region, what they did was pull out the hairs of his beard and whip his back. And in that foolishness, in that foolishness, look at what verse 25 of chapter 1 says. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness, the weakness, the weakness of God is stronger than men. In all of our proud self-centeredness, we don't need the cross. And God in the weakness and foolishness of the cross. Look at the, th this is why Carson was right. Nothing separates us from the irony of this text as much as our own cultural savvy. Think about it. We are so proud and self-centered that we reject the cross. We are so proud and self-centered that we reject the cross. And the message of the cross is that God became humble and God died for somebody else. And this message of the cross is the only hope we have of being unlocked out of our deadly pride and self-centered sinfulness to be liberated into forgiveness and grace and glory. And we have to embrace the foolishness of God as wiser than all the wisdom of men. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. No, none of you, none of you, not one of you is willing to take up the cross. But if the Spirit of God stops your heart and starts it again, then taking up the cross will be a glory for you. Only the Spirit of God can make that transformation. And the good news is that He does. The second truth about how the Holy Spirit loves, loves to push us into the cross is that the Holy Spirit gives us courage to share the message of the cross faithfully. We need courage to share the message of the cross Verse 3 of chapter 2, Paul said, I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. What Paul refers to there in verse 3 of chapter 2 may have been a physical handicap. It may have been a problem with his eyes. It may have been a problem with his speech. It may have been a thorn in the flesh, maybe a person or even satanic opposition. It may have been people around him mocking him or persecuting him. Whatever it was, what it specifically means is this. Paul was weak, and at times he was afraid and trembling. If, if you are going to share the message of the cross out with people that don't know Jesus yet in evangelism, or even within the ministries of the church as you share the message of the cross with each other, if you're going to work in the crosswalk ministry, if you're going to work in, in youth ministry, if you're going to serve in, in one of our ABFs as a small group leader or something like that, you are going to feel weakness and personal inadequacy. And that's okay. Because when you are weak, then you are strong. I want to show you uh, two places in Acts where we see this. Turn back to Acts 18. Turn back to Acts 18, and it's worth turning back to Acts 18 because Acts 18 is actually the story of what happened to Paul while he was in Corinth. In other words, what Paul is writing about in, in the Corinthian epistle is the ex this experience that happened to him while he was in Corinth. Acts 18, verses 9 and 10. How did Paul feel when he shared the message of the cross? 
Uh, it says in, in verse 8 of Acts 18 that many of the Corinthians hearing Paul believed and were baptized, but there was much opposition. Verse 9 says, The Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. When Paul was there in Corinth, he was feeling afraid, and he was feeling tempted to be silent. When God himself says there in verse 9, do not be afraid, what God is saying is, what literally that means, God is saying, hey, I know you feel afraid. You don't have to be afraid anymore. When God says, do not be silent, what God is saying is, I know you want to be silent because you feel weak. Hey, do not be silent. In me, you have the strength to speak up. The mission of the church is to make and train disciples who make and train disciples. That's why we're here. We cannot do that if the fear of man silences us and strangles us. We need courage and confidence. Courage is not fearlessness. Courage is hearing God speak into my fear, do not be afraid. I am with you. I have many people in this city, and if you shut your mouth, I'm going to go reach them through somebody else, but I want to reach them through you, so go and speak. Turn to one more place, two chapters back in Acts 16. This is about how the Holy Spirit gives us courage to speak. Acts 16, verses 13 and 14. This is about, a, a, about confidence and courage to speak. I'm teaching the fundamentals of the faith class on Sunday night, and I just sh showed them this text when we talked about evangelism, and uh, I, I love the simplicity of this text. Acts 16, verses 13 and 14. And the Sabbath, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we, look at this. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Confidence in personal ministry to make and train disciples comes from this. Look at what verse 13 says. This is the 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 is saying anything. It's saying all of the rhetorical and technological savvy of the world is useless. Look at what verse 13 of the text says. The, the, the amazing plan of ministry is two things. Sit down and speak. And then it says in verse 14, the Lord opens hearts when we sit down and speak. I love that. There's no special footnote in the Greek. When you sit down, make sure you're wearing a certain kind of pants and a certain kind of sandals. And there's no footnote in the Greek. Well, when you speak, make sure you use the words that that person would really want to hear and figure out what's going on so you can be very savvy in how you say it. It simply says, sit down, meaning personal relationship, and speak, meaning talk about Jesus Christ. That's all that you have to do. The mission of the church is to make and train disciples who make and train disciples. And to do that, you have to sit down with people and speak with them. And this is what happens. This is what happens. We talk ourselves out of that because we think, well, I'm not good enough at sitting down and I'm not good enough at speaking. But what verse 14 says is, there was a woman there and she responded to the message, and it had nothing to do with my ability to sit down and my ability to speak. It says the Lord opened her heart. I'm, I do not know exactly how the Trinity works, but I really think that it works like this, according to 16, 14 of Acts. A believer speaks gospel words to another person, and it is as if the Holy Spirit of God 
hears that conversation and he's like, wait, they're talking about Jesus. They're talking about the cross of Christ. I love that stuff. I'm going to get down there, get inside of those words, get inside of that heart, and make these words that I love of Jesus Christ crucified, make them come to life and change somebody's life. That happens all the time. And all you've got to do is sit down and speak with no confidence in your flesh and all confidence in Jesus Christ. third thing the Holy Spirit does is he constrains us that the message of the cross is the only message that we preach. Back in 1 Corinthians 2, this all comes down to that little word except in verse 2. Not except like A-C-C, but except, E-X-C. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. With that word except, Paul draws an exclusive circle around his subject matter. And so do I. I am not your pastor teacher to talk to you about this, that, and the other thing. Before Paul ever preached his first message in Corinth, he knew what his message would be. You feel that? He didn't have to go into the city and do a marketing campaign. He didn't have to survey what are there, what's really going on there. He knew exactly what he was going to preach. Jesus Christ and him crucified. Jesus Christ, his person, his deity, his humanity, his messiahship, and him crucified, his work, his baptism, his miracles, his life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. Of course, 1 Corinthians 2, 2 is further unpacked in the classic text of 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul says, I delivered to you what I also received. I delivered to you what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. I delivered to you exactly what I received. If you want to judge my preaching, if you want to judge the teaching in your ABF that you attend, and by the way, if you judge the teaching in the ABF you attend, judge it very gently. These ABF leaders are giving of their own time and they're volunteering. But if you want to judge the teaching you receive in your ABF or hear from this pulpit, this is how you judge it. Not, not, I like it because it made me feel good. Not, I like it because it made me feel bad and I like to feel bad. The way you judge the faithfulness of the teaching is exactly this question. Did that teacher deliver exactly what he received? Did that teacher deliver to us faithfully exactly what he received from the Spirit of God in the Word of God. That's really all that matters. This is the difference between what a speaker, I love how he preaches, and what a message, I love what he preaches. This is the difference between what a sermon And what a savior. And we only ever want the latter because that's the only thing that the Holy Spirit ever wants. Our eyes to be riveted upon the beauty of the blood of Christ. If that's the message, the fourth thing that the Spirit does is He helps the reception of that message. Actually, He does more than help it. He enables the reception of that message. The Holy Spirit convicts us that the righteousness of the cross is what we need. And this is right here in our text in the, in the balance of chapter 2. It says in verse 10, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. It says in verse 12, now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand 
the things of the cross. Verse 12 says, we've received the Spirit that we might understand the things of the cross. Question, what does it mean to understand the cross? That's the question. What does it mean to understand the cross? Does it mean to understand the medical facts of what happens to a body at crucifixion? No. Does it mean to understand the historical facts of Pilate and Rome and the trial and the arrest? No. Does it mean to understand the doctrinal facts of sacrifice and Passover and substitution? No. You can know all those things and still not understand the cross. What verses 10 and verse 12 are saying is that to understand the cross, there has to be not only an external proclamation of the cross, but there has to be an internal reception of the cross. And that internal reception of the cross only comes when the Holy Spirit of God breaks through the mind and the heart so that you understand the cross. What that means for you, you in this moment, in this worship service, what that means for you is for you to understand the cross right now, the Holy Spirit has to break through your worldly rejection. For you to understand the cross, the Holy Spirit has to break through your self-centered self-protection, your egotistical excuse-making, your ultra-creative blame-shifting and subject-changing so that you become someone who hears the message of the cross and you cannot help but say, I need that. It's my only hope. Everything else is folly and sinking sand, but that and that alone is wisdom and righteousness and power and glory and redemption. To understand the cross is to see God in his holiness and me in my utter neediness and sinfulness and to realize the only place those two can meet is on that wood that is soaked in blood. To understand the cross is to understand our need of salvation and God's provision in Jesus Christ. In fact, to understand the cross is simply to become someone who says verse 30 of chapter 1. To understand the cross is to become someone who says verse 30 of chapter 1. Because of him, I am in Christ Jesus who has become to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption so that as it is written let the one who boasts boast in the Lord Jesus Christ is my righteousness Jesus Christ is my wisdom Jesus Christ is my redemption this is what it means to understand the cross let's pray Heavenly Father by the power of your spirit Bring us to understand the message of the cross. By the convicting ministry of your Holy Spirit, bring us to the table of Jesus Christ, very aware of our sinfulness and so aware of Christ's sinlessness and the power of his cross. This we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen.